I will begin the Q&A. I will start off with a few questions and um, for the last 15 to 10 minutes, I will open the Q&A to the members of the floor. Right. Now, <clears throat> we let Dr. Lee have a rest first. <laughs> so, um, I'll begin uh, my questioning with um, Melissa. You took a very big leap in your life from uh, advertising and you quit your job to take over this family um, legacy. Can you share with us that journey? It's a momentous decision, isn't it? Actually, if you've worked in advertising, it's not that difficult a decision. <laughs> um, I, was, I was very exhausted. Um, I had been running an advertising agency for 10 years and I just felt that there was very little meaning to what I was doing um, and I really wanted out and so I had always asked my uncle, can I please intern with you? Um, and so the timing really was, I felt God's timing that, um, that he, when just before he passed on, we, uh, we did have a conversation um, with the family as to whether was this something that he wanted to continue on to the next generation. And so that conversation happened, thankfully, um, and everybody agreed that yes, we want to continue the museum on for the next generation. And um, so I guess I was just probably the most eager one of the family to, <laughs> to like, me, me, please, I want to do it. And I want to get out of advertising. So, um, yeah, I sold um, my shares in the advertising agency and I think the most, the, the most challenging thing has just been the journey back from KL to Malacca and the drive, but um, it, every, every time I get there, I'm just, I just feel really thankful to be part of this journey. Now, in terms of uh, books, uh, the literary sense of it, I had a chance of reading the book on the museum now, um, did you have a hand in uh, producing it? Can you share with us the, the process behind producing that book about uh, the, your family's museum? So actually, in, originally the family had commissioned me to write a book about the family. It then happened that we did a tour book, uh, a guide, uh, a, a tour, so when um, visitors came to the museum, they could take their own guided tour. And a lot of people asked us whether they could buy that book. And so that's how it became this book. Um, and then it so happened that actually it was the 30th anniversary of the museum last year. And uh, so we thought, okay, a commemorative book is something which was worth um, putting out. So the guided book became this commemorative book and I think um, having the background in advertising actually helped a lot to put it together because in terms of um, publishing a book, having the layout um, knowledge and then um, tapping in on the resources of um, a photo, um, a, photo a, a very good photographer who I used to work with, um, his name is Ismadi, so he came on board and um, a lot of this process has also been asking for a lot of favours along the way because um, in, unfortunately in terms of the heritage industry uh, it's not as lucrative as it would be in the corporate advertising world um, but I think um, everybody's kind of looking for something a bit more meaningful in their lives and so thankfully they came on board and, and helped out with photography as well. And, and that book itself, there were a lot of pictures and these are tangible things and uh, besides being a visitor a reader to that book can see all these objects but how do you try and convey that behind this object there are stories so i've read the stories about the family the chan family so how do you weave that story and make that book a living breathing thing so that people understood that it's not these are not just you know objects there's there's a past behind them? Yeah. Um, well, one of the things that I started off with was to ask the family what they use these objects for. 
for instance, they're very foreign objects. Like there is a Putu Mayam maker in the house, and I think that captured my attention because it was something which I thought Putu Mayam was interesting because it's a Indian delicacy, and it was something which my grandmother loved、um, to make. And my grandfather had actually made a Putu Mayam maker in a bench so that it was easier for her to、um, to make the Putu Mayam,、uh, and I thought. Those sort of anecdotal stories were very interesting. Another one is the ice cream maker, which、um, okay, ice cream was maybe a bit more atas.、Um, not everybody had it, but、um, the, the the stories that they shared was that、uh, they would go to the kedai and、uh, they would get the、uh, the ice and the dry ice,、uh, not the dry ice, the ice as well. Yeah, normal ice as well as the carnation. At the ice batu, yeah, and the carnation, and they would、um, grind it、um, for half an hour. So, I guess now with Hagen Das and Baskin Robbins, it's so different. You just go out and you get it. But at that time, you know,、um, I think these were stories that really captured my imagination. And and when I read it, it's it's the kitchen that captures the most attention because being a Malay, ah,、uh, some of the things there also harkens back to my very own past. The the batu killing and. Things like that, and、um, your decision to talk about all these things does it、uh, help to make your history come alive? I hope that it helps to bridge to the other cultures more because I think the spirit of the Peranakan Chinese is about assimilation and adoption, and it's about a shared culture. It's an early Malaysia,、uh, a couple, it, it's about people who came from different parts, and then how did they negotiate their identity in a new land? So, I think that's what we're trying to promote and and encourage at the museum to have these sort of dialogues as well, because it is about、um, what does it mean to be Malaysian right now as well. So we move on to your new book. The book that's going to be published hopefully by the end of the year, and you managed to read. Will be, will be, will be. God willing. Yes. <laughs>、um, you managed to、uh, share with us two stories, and what I found interesting is compared to Dr. Lee, she, she has many protagonists telling the stories, and yours so far,、um, you had that first person telling the story. Tell us the decision behind that. That、uh, it's. It's told by the first person, I. Okay, sorry. Actually, it does have different.、Um, so the characters are、uh, the eight、um, eight children and the mother and father and、um, the grandfather and yeah. So, so but every character will have a story. Right. Every character will have a story, but it's from the family. Actually, listening to Doctor Lee's, I realized that.、Um, I wish that. I, well, I guess it's different. It's a, it's a different journey. I think, like what you were saying, is that、um, because I'm representing the family, there's a little bit more like, okay, I cannot say too many, too much of the of the the naughty stuff. So, yeah, <laughs> it's a, it's a little bit more PG thirteen in that sense. Yeah. Now,、um, I also found it very interesting because as you read, there were illustrations. To help you, how closely did you work with the illustrator in, in trying to bring your stories to life? And and I was very it's、uh, very impressed with the illustrations produced. Yeah, I must let her know that、um, very closely. We started off three years ago, and she it has really been a process of getting the tone and manner right. And I think she's really gotten it down now, where it has this sense of nostalgia. Um, I think we looked at a lot of Lat comics because I mean everybody looks at Lat and that's something that that I think Malaysians generally can relate to.、Um, but I think because the house itself had so much detail, so I think Pretty really tried to put more detail into it. She, her, her earlier illustrations were very simple,、um, but as she's matured and and I think our relationship has also、um, uh, her hearing the stories and understanding it. Um, she's put a lot more detail into it because I think it's also been a journey for her to understand her own Peranakan culture. Now, in terms of、um, 
trying to improve your storytelling and your book? Do you have a sounding board? People whom you share your stories, throw off ideas with so that you know you can have a, a really good look and try to make your story better. I think one of them would definitely be Sukim after this. <laughs> the first one was definitely the family. I had to make sure that the family were okay with the stories first. So that was um, the, what I've been doing. And um, uh, my best friend has been helping me to edit. She's an editor um, on the side. Uh, so it's again been um, sort of asking people. For the first book, I asked a historian. Um, his name is Peter Lee, and he very kindly um, looked through all the facts um, to make sure that everything is, is right. Um, so I'm very thankful that a lot of people in um, the, the Peranakan um, Chinese community have really um, said, you know, we'll just help along the way. Um. Because it is a story of your family, I'm sure that and there are a lot of stories. So how do you decide which story you want to share and which you keep it aside or say this is for uh, this is not meant for public consumption or uh, let's do it some other time. Uh, I think, well, to be fair that each family member had a say and that there was a story that represented each of the family members um, because they also commissioned me to do the book. Um, so they're my clients. Uh, um, so yeah, that was one of the and, and then also, I wanted it to represent before the war. Uh, so um, stories that happened and, and something to paint the picture of the Pranakans in their heyday and at their height of this eliteness. And then during the war, um, how that really humbled them. And, and they had to be just like, and, and survive just like anybody else. And then after the war, what it means to negotiate this identity um, and not have all their 12-day um, weddings anymore. <laughs> That's a long day. Yeah. Yeah. All right, now I, I'll direct my questions to Dr. Lee Su Kim. Now, you uh, said this to um, in a, an interview with the Malay Mail. You said, it is a struggle to record our stories and a way of life before they disappear. Why is it a struggle? Um, I suppose if you just look at the three generations from the time of the parents, where they were really uh, immersed in the culture, right? the, we call it the, the generation that was before World War II. Right? They really were repositories of the culture, but the women folk then were not so privileged as to have uh, access to education. Like for example, my grandmother, uh, I think she got married at 16 years old. She was educated just up to standard three and then settled over. Uh, the more education, the more intelligent, the more you're going to have your own viewpoints, the more you're going to become a rebel. So, taken away. But they were the ones that really know uh, a lot of the nuances and the flavors of the culture. Then along came my generation, the baby boomers, who was born after World War II. We are like the bridging generation. Uh, instead of being told to stay in the kitchen and learn how to cut the the vegetables and prepare the ulam and cook the pongte and spend the time uh, decorating the you know the dishes and so on. We were privileged because we had access to education. We were chased out of the kitchens. Mother was chased to get up, don't disturb, go and study, try to get a good education, and hopefully you go to university, marry your husband and so on. So we are in the generation I say tampo, tampo, no a bit here and a bit there. Right? Uh, and then comes this next generation, uh, the millennials, right? born in the present young generation, who really know nothing. Uh, of course, there's a generalization. There are many who, like, like, uh, who know quite a lot. But many of them, yeah, don't you know. I actually come across people who says, Dr. Lee, I'm a nun. How do you know? Uh, I read your book, and the stories remind me of my grandmother. You know, things like that. And stories of people who actually say that, I only found out I was a Baba when I got married and my mother says she wants everybody to come in the Baba Nyonya uh, costumes because it's Baba Nyonya theme. And she wants to call Nyonya this and Baba that. And he said, and he asked, what, why is this Baba Nyonya? And then the mother says, didn't you know? You're a Baba. You know, like, that kind of thing. It's just lost. Because uh, after uh, national, well, with nationalization and so on, the building of the nation, 
um, all the small cultures got, sort of got frittered away and it became very important for nation building. What are you? Malay, Chinese, Indian, others. So all the complexities of a multicultural uh, society gets uh, sort of eroded away. We had to call ourselves like, wow, what? We are Malay, Chinese, Indian, others, and everything, but we can't really call ourselves others when we are losing out, so we call ourselves Chinese. So it all depended very much, I think, strongly on the women. The women were the ones who passed the culture along. But with education, the privileges, and all that, we don't, really don't have the time. And so by the time the next generation comes along, many of them really don't know anything, right? In terms of the culture, knowledge of the culture. Now, um, going back to the question I asked uh, Melissa, uh, you wrote uh, in many different perspectives, there were many voices. I remember, um, I can't remember which book, um, from the pers pers perspective of, uh, of a, um, an old man who's visiting her, her daughter in Houston. And um, I was also very interested in the tenant upstairs. And you've got three major, very, uh, two of them, the, the mother and then the tenant upstairs, who are very forceful women. So how do you go about getting into the mindscape of all these different characters, both male and female, young and old, um, weak and as well as strong? Good question, because sometimes it's difficult. <laughs> For example, the third book that I'm trying to write is I'm trying to orient it towards the Babas, trying to bring up more of the Baba voice. Because interestingly, while the Pranakan culture was rich and zenith mainly to the wealth and the, and of the Babas, ironically now, it's the female aspects of the culture that seems to be dominant now. So now we're well known for the clothes, the cuisine and so on. Uh, so whenever I write my stories, I tend to always keep on veering towards writing from a woman's psyche, you know. So while writing this book on the Babas is quite difficult, but yeah, I guess you have to sort of immerse yourself into the character and try, try your best. But certainly it's a challenge yet on orientating yourself. In, in writing fiction, does being an acad uh, academician help you with the literature background? Uh, I think, I hope it does. Sometimes it's not an advantage because I tend to get pedantic in the English language teacher. You must have the paragraph and the, the supporting details and so on. So I try sometimes, I, I get worried that sometimes am I being pedantic, am I being teacher, too teachery in my stories. Uh, I try to write uh, with more inferencing and so on. So being a teach, uh, well, teacher and lecturers, I sort of feel that that sort of interferes sometimes. So pros and cons, I suppose, of my writing uh, career. Uh, let's move on to the production of the book itself. Mm -hmm. So uh, Sarun's Secrets and Kabaya Tales seems to have the, the, a similar thing. The cover is the same, mm -hmm. the font is the same. Mm -hmm. um, tell us uh, be the decision behind that. And now that uh, your publisher or is intent on uh, making you do a trilogy, Mm -hmm. And I see you have the same theme again. So the, right. the, the, the look of the book. Okay. Um, yeah, like, like what Melissa mentioned, there's a lot of work. Because when you produce something, when you write something, you want it to be something worthwhile. You want to be, when you're gone from this earth, you still have something left behind that is worthy of, of attention. So uh, I, don't, I didn't want to interfere too much, but at the same time, you want the right cover, you want the right colors and so on. But of course, the publishers will take care of the cover that's in the contract, but they work closely with me. They sent me the a draft of the cover, and of course, I didn't like it. They had a uh, blue, dark blue, which wasn't quite the essence of something that I would choose as a cover for a book on Kabai Tales. So I wanted strong Pranagan colors, and I told them I'd like pink or green. So again, there's a lot of uh, input from, yeah, so it's, it's good if you get publishers that are willing to listen instead of saying, no, I want it this way and so on. So you have to have a very good relationship with your uh, publishers, your editors. Similarly, I like to put in words like Xiao, Wuchilaka, and so on. Uh, the publishers are in Singapore, so uh, if they say, no, you can't have these words, then you have to argue with them, no, I want it because you want, I'm, I'm working so hard to bring up the flavors and the colors and all the sounds and the earthiness and the bodiness of the Nyonias and Baba. So uh, it certainly helps if you have a good relationship with editors. 
uh, book publishers, people respect you and they listen to you. So Martian Cavendish uh, has a niche in Peranakan books and they sort of are very uh, appreciative of what I, I tell them. And Alisa, what about your decision? Uh, we saw a bit of, I think it's the content, where you've got the before the war, during the war and after the war. So what about the process of your decision making, how your book is going to look like? Working with a designer also from um, the ex agency that I used to work in, who's also very tired of advertising. Um, so she's a very skilled designer, and uh, we worked on. I think the first thing that she looked at were the tiles and um, the tiles from the house. So yeah, she wanted to bring that out um, uh, in in the pages, and also working with Pretty's drawings. So Pretty's drawings is the one that comes out as as the. Um, as the feature, and hers will just be very um, neat layout, yeah. and I think photos from the family as well um, will be included in hers. I like to go back to the fact that uh, you were having, you know, discussions, and you were uh, insistent that you include some certain words like, you know, telaka and all those words. Now, does the inclusion um, of all this? Uh, even uh, Hokkien or Malay um, help to flavour your your book or does it hinder foreign readers? Very good question. That would be the challenge when you write about a culture that's very uh, that's so hybrid in essence, right? So uh, if you had like very proper English like, hello, good morning, are you having cucumber sandwiches and all that? It just will not bring up the, the flavour, the cadences, the nuances. So. It's important, I feel, to bring in these uh, these uh, flavors. But at the same time, you have to walk this thin red line. How much do you put in? How much don't you put in? If you put in, for example, chilaka, will someone reading the book in England or New York understand what's that? So you have to put in context and so on. At the same time, you don't want to use translation as xiao, in brackets, crazy, and so on. You know? That doesn't work. Uh, we did toy around I did it. Do we have a glossary? Should we have footnotes? And so on. But uh, I looked at all the texts written by, well, look, look at, for example, Gone in the Wind, Margaret Mitchell, right? Lots and lots of uh, black English ebonics, you know, the, the lady in the petticoat, the slave girl, and, yeah, ma'am, I don't know how to be king of baby. Go, you go, girl. And, and there's no translation in the glossary, but it comes up beautifully. So I think that's a challenge, and I will try to, to do that. To bring did, did you think the same as well when you, when you are writing your story? Yeah, I had, um, so, like Suki said, actually for my generation, really we don't know very much, <laughs> but it was really a lot of listening. I think that's what I needed to do, which was really listen to the older generation and pick up certain things that they said and go, okay, that actually makes for a really nice thing to put. And then do you put it in brackets also? Yeah, so, um, okay, the book is Noemiya Tan Tuan Inga, but I think reading his book helped because he writes a lot of, um, uh, he puts in Mal uh, Malay words as well, yeah, but then how do, you, um, how do you say it such that it doesn't have the brackets inside here? Yeah. Right, um, I believe we've got like five minutes left. Yes, so um, let us hear questions from members of the floor. question is for Dr. Lee. Is writing a lucrative business in Malaysia? You are an author of several books and some of which were best sellers with several reprints. Have you become rich as a result of these books? <laughs> no. <laughs> Not at all. For example, if your book is, uh, well, you only get 10%. So, if you had the distribution networks, your own printing press, for, for example, in Melissa's, Melissa's case, I would say, uh, publish the book yourself if you have a strong distribution or you are, for example, if you have, have a museum, if you have your own store, then why do you want to give your book to someone else? Because you're only going to get 10% and the publishers may take 90% of it. So the answer to that, unless I can write something uh, like what J.K. Rowling did, then I'm going to reach it. Then I won't be sitting here, I'll be in the French Riviera. <laughs> but because I'm here, I certainly have to say it. So it's 
very much like a responsibility, kind of like, you, you, you can, I'm not saying I can write, but because I like writing, you feel that you have to do it kind of thing. And I actually get pleasantly surprised, like, even though you like to buy my book, you know, I get pleasantly thrilled when someone says that oh, they have enjoyed it. So it's more a labor of love. Any, any questions from uh, any members of the vlog? Genre. It's a repartee, dendang saya. Uh, I mean, I really uh, share with Melissa the concern that everything is dying away. And dendang saya is almost extinct. There are just a few more doyens in dendang saya. It's a kind of repartee where you sing something, two verses is building to the beautiful moon of the stars, and the last two lines that I'm doing will give a message that I like you, you look very handsome, come visit me tonight, kind of thing. And then when you answer, you have to sing again and then present that. And this in the past could go on and on, you know, in a, a wonderful kind of banter, but uh, that art is also being lost. Dead. <laughs> um, I really don't know. That's for others to tell. I really don't know. But uh, I get, like I shared this now, I was quite pleasantly surprised when someone came up to me at one of these talks I gave and said, because of your books, because I read your books, I found out that I'm a Nyonya, you know, or that my grandmother was a Nyonya, but she married a Cantonese and so on, and therefore I am 160 and I'm Nyonya. So in that sense, uh, this awareness of identity. I mean, even my own cousin, uh, his father, who lives in Singapore, he asked, his father is 100% uh, Baba, but he doesn't know a thing about Babaness. He asked me, uh, Kim, what is Baba Baba? How do you convert into a being a Baba? And, and his father's a Baba. So, uh, on the one hand, uh, I'm not saying that we have to be so ethnocentric that I'm Baba, no, no. some of them are too precious and they get very you know, uptight and atas about it, which is also not very nice. But at the same time, uh, in the face of globalization and uh, blandness, it's important to cling also to our cultural identity. So I hope, if not anything, the stories of mine have created that kind of, of awareness and hopefully uh, pride in, in the cultural identity. Maybe if I can also share, I think your stories have also inspired like me in terms of, um, because there are so many books that are very academic, whereas yours really touch the heart of the culture and the living culture. And we also get a lot of um, visitors to the museum. So after they've taken the tour, they, her books are one of the top selling books in the house because it brings to life the stories that happen within, the, within you know, what happens in the kitchen or, you know, all these gossips and, yeah. Publishers are making lots of money in answer to that question. <laughs> so I'm not seeing the money. <laughs> well, I believe we've come to the end of today's uh, literary matinee. Thank you to Dr. Lee Su Kim and thank you, Melissa Chan, for being with us today.